podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with myself, Jackie Jones, and the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook. And this is episode 100, Bob. This is our centenary episode. I know. I would look for the champagne and it's gone. So I've oh, got... no. I have got... <laughs> a can of coke here oh bless so, you Matt. i thought it's really important to celebrate it so have you got anything to drink there i have i've got a cup of coffee well congratulations to you both and cheers congrats- bob cheers cheers and, <laughs> and congratulations to all the people that have been with us all this time and the new people that have joined and of course the people listening today i went on um the um podcast anchor where we publish this and they send it out to everybody to see how many listens we've had and we've had over twenty two thousand listens oh that's amazing Anita. and that's that's just on the podcast that's not including youtube which you know there's i think there's regularly 250 300 people an episode listening on youtube so the numbers are really good bob that's great and consistent yes yes that's the thing consistent over a hundred episodes. I know. I know it's amazing, really. And of course, the one we picked today is um, I think you said it's about the concept of change in psychotherapy. It is, yes. The importance of the concept of change in the therapeutic process. It's very important that of course we've got a new king as well. Well yep. we will have. Well, we have, but the carnation is on the you know sixth, I think. Um yes. so if you talk about change, I mean King Charles has waited a long time. He has, to be to, fair, uh, to actually get his uh, hand on the crown or hands on the crown, if you like. Yeah, and yeah. What change he actually bring, brings? Yeah, change think, can be really scary for a lot of people. <laughs> might be for him. It might be. Yeah, it's going to be completely different because he he was allowed to be quite outspoken as a prince, but now he's the king. He needs to be unbiased and isn't really allowed an opinion is he no well on some things but he's supposed to be neutral yeah so it's it's a new it's a new era yes king charles what's the actual name for it so there's an actual name isn't there for this particular era it isn't like not caucasian but it's something like that you know like the victorian age of the Elizabethan age yeah this is I read it the other day it was a mouthful but it's a new era I've, I've, I don't think I've even heard it so I have no idea but yeah it is it's a new era the, the world is definitely changing there's a lot of changes going on and some of them well most of them 99.9% of them we don't have any control over no that's absolutely true uh, I was two when the uh, Queen, you know, the, uh, the Queen before Charles actually came to the throne. Wow. Now I'm seeing another one in. Yeah. See, I often think that your generation and my generation have seen an awful lot of changes, you know, inventions, new things, the internet, the microwave, the, you know, the duvet, the continental quilt, things like see, lots and lots of, of changes yeah. in, in my lifetime. Even daytime television, when I was a kid, television didn't start until like five o'clock at night or whatever. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about therapy. Yes. Move change in therapy. So um, I'll be interested in your thoughts about change. I mean, you know, it's really interesting. Different approaches to therapy, isn't it? But, you know, whatever different approaches we talk about, um, one of the goals, if you like, um, is positive change. Yeah. The Eric Berner originator of transaction analysis, and as you know, contractual theory is a hallmark of transaction analysis. Um, he was uh, 
always emphasizing the importance of contracts um, with a positive change. Yeah. So they need to be specific. The change needs to be specific, observable, behavioral. Um, and you, you wouldn't just have a contract for meandering around, for example. You'd no. have a, a particular specific behavioral observable contract for positive change. So in TA, yeah. change through contracts is actually um, central to the therapy. What if a client comes and they don't know what they want to change? We did a podcast. We did a podcast, didn't we? About God, I don't know what number. We're up to we're up to hundred. So I had no idea. But it was about the clients who didn't know what they wanted. Yeah, when they come and they just say, "I want to be happy." Yeah, I think it was number fifty six or fifty seven. I can't remember. We talked for quite a long time about that, and many clients do, of course. Uh, come and they don't actually know what they want to change they have a level of discomfort yeah usually the motivation for something to happen it's usually that the discomfort will be taken away somehow but you see i think that in itself uh is change isn't it yeah yeah now, yeah i know ta is very hot on contract specific behavioral observable positive change some sort of change or transformation through the therapy process. Um, I do believe most people that come through our door, if not all, have some level of motivation. Yeah. Not when coming through that door in the first place, or even picking up the phone, or writing an email, or sending a text, or whatever it is, um, may be a script change in itself. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So even though most TA therapists will look for contractual change, um, and in, anyway, in answer to your first question, of, uh, what do people don't know what they want to change? Um, well, I can tell you exactly what I do, uh, which is um, believe that you know the motiva they're here, so there's a motivation somewhere. Yeah. Usually, um, I um, negotiate with the client if they don't know what they want to change. Um, for an exploring contract. Yeah. Where we'll explore maybe what brought them here, you know, uh, how come they came through the door in the first place, what's happening for them in their life. And I haven't necessarily contracted for specific change. Um, so exploring is fine for me. But mm -hmm. out of the exploring, if you like, we usually settle on some contract for change. Yeah. Is yeah. that the same as you? Yeah, yeah. Because, you know, yes, the client's motivated when they come, you know, to, to like you said, to pick up the phone to make the appointment to, to arrive on time and all those sort of things. But they've got to be prepared to take action as well and to to do something different. And that can be a big thing for some clients. They want to change, but they don't necessarily want to do anything different. Well, I think there's a difference between intrapsychic change or internal change yeah. and external change. Yeah, yeah. So quite often, we aren't aware of the changes that maybe are occurring with our clients. And the, the second thing, I, I, I know I've said this statement a thousand, maybe 2,000 times through my career, change is a process, not an event. Mm. But it nearly always starts with internal change. Yeah. And then from the internal change comes the external change. It's always that way around. Yeah. So in therapy, are we changing the internal then? The, like the thoughts? Because to me, everything starts with a, a thought and awareness of, of needing to change. Well, it doesn't with me. Um, I understand where you're coming from. But I think if we're talking about the internal world, I, I think we're talking about not just thoughts, but feelings, maybe, you know, spiritual change uh spiritual change maybe um yeah even you know yeah maybe thoughts and feelings are the major two 
But do, um, do, you, do spiritual change and feelings and everything, do they not all start with a thought? And being conscious of where we are now and where we want to be with it? Well, now you're into deep areas, you see. I think we have lots of unawareness processes, if you like, which doesn't necessarily demand thinking. Wow. That's a new one on me, Bob. <laughs> In other words, I think you have an energetic change. You see, thoughts are energy. Yeah, yeah. Feelings are energy. Yeah. So it doesn't have to start with the thinking. It could start with the feeling. Okay. You can have you could have feel if you talk about energetic processes, you could have uh, or one way of thinking is that in a cycle is that the, the the energetic process if you like is a feeling and the thought comes after that doesn't necessarily mean the thought comes first and the feeling comes afterwards okay people can have you, you know yourself you can offer and well perhaps you don't perhaps you're going to dis, you're going to disagree with me which is fine as well but i'd be odd if you if i well might not be odd actually you might not think it's odd um, but many times I've had a feeling and I haven't the idea what the feeling's about because I've been thinking about the feeling. The feeling's just happened. It's like a pressure cooker. Suddenly it's happened. Suddenly I feel, feel sad for some reason or I feel depressed for some reason or I feel emotional for some reason. And I haven't been thinking about I was sad. I just felt sad. Yeah, yeah. And maybe it's not always a conscious thought. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, you know, do you think differently then? Well, yeah, I think so. <laughs> There's a lot of thinking going on, Bob. It's like I used to, I've, I've got a lot better now, but I used to have a fear of flying, didn't like flying. And I can remember I was going, I had to go to Tesco to buy some toiletries, deodorants and things like that to go on the flight. You know, you always buy new stuff, new toothbrush when you're going away. And I got anxious going to Tesco's, buying things for the flight. Mm. But for me, that was connected to the flight because I knew I needed those before I went on the flight. So I wasn't thinking about the flight, mm. but it was connected to the flight in some way, if that makes sense. Uh, well, I think you're saying the flight was a trigger or something for that was happening internally. Quite possibly, but you know, I wasn't having a conscious thought about the fact the fat flight that made me feel anxious. I was going to buy something that was relevant to flying. I don't know, but yeah, it's kind of like my brain connects up the dots that aren't necessarily needed connecting up a lot of the time. So for you, everything starts with thinking. Yeah, even if I'm not aware that I'm having a thought. So. So there are many approaches that would have different ways of thinking about that. Like yeah. I said, yeah. Start with emotions rather than feelings. Yeah. Yeah, but I am a very thinking person. It's what I do. So there for you with clients, I suspect you'll be after a specific change around thinking. Yeah, an awareness around our thoughts, yeah. Yeah. And that in itself is a change, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Followed up by behavioural action. Yeah, yeah. And I like the fact that you were talking about, you know, internal change and external change. You know, they, they are two different ones. We can, we can present and look like we're making a change. We can get up and go to the gym and do all of those... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That there is is a external change, but whether there's an internal change as well, mm. we can't see that. Yeah. Right, and of course, with clients, and you will have had this experience, I'm sure. Um, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Do they know what's going on internally because they're so disconnected to different parts of the self? Mm. <clears throat> So they could be, they could feel things and be disconnected from their thinking, for example. Yeah, yeah. So they feel things, but they don't necessarily think what they're feeling. 
Yeah. Yeah, because it's different for everybody. Yeah, and I do believe that most people you see in therapy are disconnected at some levels. Yeah. I know when I went to therapy for the first time, I knew this huge disconnect between, you know, maybe what was happening at a thinking level and what was happening at a feeling level. And part of the therapy was perhaps a big part of the beginning of the therapy anyway, was to help me have some sort of connection between the two parts of what I was thinking and what I was feeling. And yeah. Sometimes I didn't know what I was thinking at all. I had a feeling, but I, I couldn't connect with the thought. Yeah. So I think there's the more often disturbed we are, the more fragmented we are. Yeah. Is this what you would refer to as being split off? Yes. Parts of us being split off. Yeah, yeah. We we'll dis we disown part of ourselves. Yeah. We're split off, fragmented. Yeah. Off. And the job of therapy is to help the clients be in touch with the different parts of themselves, to take ownership of the different parts of themselves, and integration is the cure. Yeah. Even the parts of ourselves that we don't necessarily like. <laughs> well, more that's that's actually more the case, actually. Yeah. But the darker sides are usually the, the parts of the sides we've cut off. Yeah. They're almost by definition will go to the darker sides of our internal processes. Um, I believe anyway. Yeah. I mean, I think the straightforward part is the parts that we like, actually. Because we we tend to take ownership of the parts of the self that we like so for example yeah if you like being a humorous person then yeah. you probably can take ownership of the fact you can express humor it's the darker sides i think that we have difficulty in taking ownership of yeah understandably but we all have them and it's about being honest and and truthful with ourselves which is quite difficult a lot of the time and to accept, like you said, those parts of us. And of course, the the therapy that is most favoured by the National Health Service in the UK is cognitive behavioural thinking. Sorry, yeah. cognitive behavioural therapy. Which yeah. Starts with, you know, all about thoughts. If we can change our thinking, that will lead to a change in our behaviour. Yeah. Changing our behaviour. Um, especially positive behaviour, is what it's about for CBT therapists. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And you, again, though, it's awareness for me. We, it, if we're aware of our unhelpful thinking at times or that negative self-talk, but often it's it's there, but we, we don't hear it we react to it and you know all those sorts of things but we're not consciously aware of the negative self-talk that we have running in the background pretty much all the time uh, no, is that just me <laughs> no you're correct you're correct that most people i believe uh are unaware because it's become because it's become like a habit yeah the habit has gone down in our levels of awareness. Yeah. So you can say to clients, well, I experience you as being very hard on yourself. And they might say, yes, I'm a very, I know I'm very hard on myself because friends say I'm hard on myself. But then are they aware then of all the negative uh, diatribe that they say every day of their, you know, their wake up to, when they go to bed? Probably not. Yeah. But they do know at some level they're hard on themselves. But the question is, do they know they're hard on themselves because friends have told them they're hard on themselves? Or do they know they're hard on themselves because they can actually take ownership of being hard on themselves? Yeah. I think they're two different things. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you're right. I think awareness is the first place. Yeah. And, you know, so so how do we create an environment in the therapy room for change what what do we as therapists need to do well i think the first place is to provide which you do all the time i do all the time which is to provide an environment 
where the person feels safe enough and secure enough to be able to just be whatever. Yeah. So that's the first step, isn't it? Yeah. The second step is, I think, which is taught in any counselling courses or any any psychotherapy courses from the word dot, is to help the um, client um, be aware of our non-judgmental stance. In other words, that we're not going to judge them negatively. Yeah, yeah. That will help them feel much safer. And most of course. So I think we have to provide an environment. We have to come from a non-judgmental stance. And I think we need a lot of patience to help a person tell their story, become aware perhaps of the different parts of themselves they weren't aware of. Um, but I think the starting point is a safe, secure environment and the therapist coming from a non-judgmental stance. Yeah. Yeah. And the, when when we do make a change, often we have to let something go. And, you know, when we, we're integrating, and I'm talking personally now, I learned, you know, things about myself that I didn't necessarily like. So I was letting go of one part of my personality, if you will, in order to pick up something else. So it's kind of like part of who I was needed to go. You know, the performing personality and the surviving personality, you know, the one that I was projecting out wasn't necessarily the authentic me, but in order to let that go, that that was quite a big thing. Yeah, I think you're correct. And, and therefore loss is a big part of change, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And understanding that and giving the client time to come to terms with that. Yeah, come to terms with the loss of what was in a, in, in the service of being able to be different. And yeah. To... Which is a bit strange, really, because if we're making change for positive things so that, you know, we're a better person and our life script is, is you know, working in our favour rather than against us and everything, you'd think it'd be really easy to let part of ourselves go, but it's it's not because it's it's our identity. It's who we've associated with for, you know, 40, 50 years, whatever it is. And to suddenly not be that person anymore, it can make us quite anxious. Oh, I think it inevitably makes ourselves anxious and, um it's a process never an event yeah yeah it needs to be so that we can you know one of the things i say to clients a lot of the time is you know we don't need to go full gusto into this it's okay to stop and tread water for a while and to just kind of like when we go into a dark room you need to allow your eyes time to adjust so we need to adjust to a new way of being when we are making a change and that's okay yeah, and I think there's always a cost to change. Yeah. The biggest cost is loss. Yeah. There's always a cost to change. And as I said, the biggest cost, I think, is loss. Yeah. I can yeah. remember when I started my training, you know, the, the, the mayor who I was training with, said that, you know, there's, there's a certain percentage of people when they go through psychotherapy training that end up, you know, splitting up from the partners because they realise how different they actually are. And when when they start to change through the training and the therapy process, you know, the, the, there's a strain on the relationship because they're not changing alongside you. Yeah, I don't know the research into those statistics, but that's correct. Yeah. And hopefully people who really love and care for people will stay with them. Yeah, yeah, but it's a big thing about communication. Oh, absolutely, and I think it's quite high, the statistics, I think you're correct. Um, it's a big thing. It's a yeah. Big change. Um, hopefully, hopefully the people who care for them will stay with them. Yeah, which I suppose, you know, for the clients, if they're making a change, relationships change alongside it. All the time. Yeah. Very interesting. 
No, it's very interesting. That's why it's important, I think, for people to be aware of the cost of change. Mm. It's not straightforward at all. No. And we can't unlearn the things that we learn in therapy. <laughs> but once we become aware, then we can't kind of go back to where we were in the first place. That's why contracts, I think, are always a process, never an event, as I said earlier. And I think some contracts may take six months, some might take six years. Yeah. Because they need to be fully integrated. Yeah. Now, the more disturbed a person is, the more fragmented they are. And then the more fragmented they are, the more ownership of different parts of the self needs to happen. And that all takes time. Yeah. Yeah, because I think, you know, sometimes in the, the therapy room, I've seen a client appear to be making changes, but the reality is it's kind of like the child trying to please you by making out like they're making a change if that makes sense but it's not it's not really a change it's not authentic it's 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 them adapting to what they think they should be doing yeah and i think that's a big part a big part of the therapy process quite often people do go down that road you just talked about um they adapt to what they think uh you want them to be like or whatever it is yeah to get it right to do yeah. the right thing yeah yeah and I think that's an important important thing for the therapist to look out for. And to have adult to adult discussions if possible. Yeah. With the client around all this and what they've changed and what they've left on. You know. Yeah. So this adaptation is talked through if it's there. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah. Because, you know, like you said earlier on, you know, having a safe space where they can, you know, practice that change out and, you know, learn about themselves in a safe environment without fear of judgment or whatever before they go out into the big wide world. Yes. And then the question is, is there always change in the psychotherapy room? You know, in other words, do clients always change? And maybe one thought process is, um, are they always going to change for the better? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the definition usually of the contract, a positive contract, that there will be change for the better. But is that always the case? Uh, that's an interesting question. Not quite for sure. I think I I hope I hope um it's that way. Yeah. The people around them might not always think it is. I know for me, but I, I was a, a people pleaser. I still am to a certain extent, but not as much as what I used to be. And when I changed that the people around me didn't necessarily like it because I wasn't pleasing them all the time. I, I was putting myself further up my priority list which wasn't what i used to do so they didn't think it was a positive change i do think though um usually in psychotherapy okay you know a person will change in some ways yeah yeah it's about achieving a contract other disciplines which doesn't have contractual theory at the hub of it will also have a the hub of it if you like transformational change yeah. So they can look at how change has, change has occurred. So I think for effective psychotherapy, um, it is important that we look at how a person's changed or yeah. hasn't. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, it's good for the client to notice that, do you know what I mean? To recap over the contract every so often and see, you know, how they are now compared to how they were when they came in. Because when it is gradual, when it is a process, I don't think we often realise how far we actually have come down the road. That's right. And as a therapist, one thing I always did religiously was to celebrate changes. Yeah. Yeah. So 
that's not as easy as it sounds because a lot of clients were brought up um, that it was the wrong thing to do, if you like, to celebrate positive yeah. change. Uh, and, and for clients to take ownership of, you know, of positive change was something I um, embedded in my therapy. Yeah. I like that because yeah, it is it is you know blowing your own trumpet or you know being big headed or or things like that. It's not you know, it's not the dumb thing a lot of the time. We're not encouraged to do that as kids or when we're growing up. No, so the therapist needs to advocate a different way of being. Yeah, yeah, and again, model it. Do you know what I mean? It's it's part of the process. Yeah. I like that. I like I like celebrating. I always I always celebrate the wins. That's what I call them. Yes, a change should be part. I think of effective therapy. Yeah, and it's built in, even yeah. though it may take a long time. Yeah, and to notice when change does occur, you know, in in the therapy process, if the client is doing something that's you know kind of unusual or not normally done, to 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 notice that and feed it back to them. Yeah, I think that's a big one. Yeah, I, I've had clients that are very amiable and very agreeable and, and everything. And the one time where they kind of disagree or say something, I will point it out to them and say, you know, how did that feel? That That's that's really, you know, a change for you. Yeah. I've enjoyed that, Bob. Thank you. You're welcome. Good. So what we're going to be talking about next time is working yeah. with the isolated client. That's a big topic. It is, yeah, quite a difficult topic as well. Okay, until next time, Bob. Thank you. Yeah. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.